platform three, British Rail apologise for the inconvenience. Hello again, you're watching Everard Junction and today will be uh, part five of uh, the uh, Building a Model Railway series that I'm doing. Uh, done quite a bit of work since you last, uh, last saw it. Um, no nothing, uh, nothing new, it's all just uh, repeats of work I've already showed you, um, such as uh, installation of additional point motors and adding extra points. So uh, I'll go over what I've, uh, what I've done since, we, since last time and uh, then we'll look at uh, building the control panel and uh, thinking about uh, some of the uncoupling uh, for getting operations in here working properly. Okay, so the biggest thing I've done is uh, the changes to all of the track work out on the main lines. I've uh, taken out the uh, crossover that was there and replaced it with uh, just two pieces of flexi track and then what I've done is I've moved them over here to this area and I've also uh, put in a new section of track there where I'd uh, lifted the old piece and it all works um, it just needs point motors adding to it and it's all been ballasted and the ballast is all dry I didn't uh, bother filming any of this because uh, this is work on the existing layout and what I'm doing here with the ballasting and stuff like that is going to be duplicated over here when I get around to doing all of this as well which I will be showing you Okay, so the next thing I've done is the uh, point work down the end that I spoke about in the previous videos. This will allow anything that brings in a train um, to, to run round and to uh, get back onto the main lines or elsewhere within the yard. Got a small area where we can run round on these two sidings. Uh, it's big enough for an 08 or smaller shunter to uh, run round in there. Um, I didn't bother connecting up this one um, because this siding may actually be shortened um, for scenic purposes and I think it's also going to be used for storage of DMUs so the need to run round um, isn't there on that siding. Uh, another reason for that was uh, I didn't want to have exactly the same point work on both pieces of track. I wanted to try and vary it a little bit. And then on the free storage sidings I've got another freeway point to small points here and they allow a slightly larger locomotive um, something about the size of a class 33 is able to get into this space here and uh, run around its train um, that it's brought in so that'll just allow me to use some slightly varied traction as well when I'm doing um, shunting in the yard I don't have to just use shunters I can use something like a uh, class 33 over there or similar size loco just thought I would quickly mention something, I don't think I've covered it yet. Um, I've mentioned that I'm using electrofrog points. Uh, something you need to do with those is to uh, use these insulating rail joiners. You can see that uh, they're made of plastic and you can see they insulate the uh, rails. You can see the frog doesn't actually come into contact with the rest of the track. That's very important because this whole area is live in an electrofrog point and you can see it splits off into two directions and I won't go into it for now uh, but basically what that means if you connect it up normally is you'll short your layout out so you have the uh, insulating joiners there and then you have feeders going to this side which powers these rails independently and then the frog can switch around and go to whichever uh, side it needs to whether it be positive or negative without having an effect on the rest of the railway if you are using insole frog points, then you don't need to worry about these at all. Just use normal metal fish plates and just lay the track as normal. Um, but I thought I'd point it out because I don't think I've actually mentioned it yet. That's something you really must do with electro frog points if you plan on using them. That's insulate the frog from the rest of the layout because it will uh, cause problems if you don't. 
one of the points that I've used is uh, an insole frog point that was uh, left over uh, from the scrapyard area. I uh, had this particular one for years, um, still works fine, and uh, saved a bit of money there, not needing to buy another point. So I do actually have one insole frog point installed in the yard now, so that will give me the opportunity to show you the wiring for a point motor. I've got all the uh, point motors installed for this area. Some more room there. And there's the uh, freeway point. Still need to sort uh, tidying out, but I uh, won't be doing that until I've got the control panel installed. So there's the uh, wiring for a uh, an insole frog point. You can see it's a lot simpler. You just have terminals A, B and C connected. So you've got the left hand side for one throw of the switch, the right hand side for the other throw of the switch, and then uh, your earth in the middle to complete the circuit. So uh, that's all the wiring you need for an in-cell frog point. Don't have to worry about anything else. All you need to do is to get the point motor to move left and right, and you achieve that with just those three wires. On the top, once you've done that, all you need to do is you need to uh, connect uh, the two rails together here because the frog is insulated with plastic. Um, Hornby makes some little clips that allow you to do that. They just clip in. I think they're just called DCC point clips or something. Um, I haven't got any of those. Um, so what I did was I just got a little piece of wire you can just see there, bent it to the correct shape and just soldered it on. While we're under here somebody asked me about um, terminating the bus wire. What do I do with the end of it? Well you can see at the moment while I'm in the middle of wiring everything up I've just got it um, cut and just pointing out into an area where um, it shouldn't uh, come into any trouble. Um, when I'm happy and everything's sort of sorted, I will insulate the ends of those with a little bit of electrical tape or perhaps some heat shrink or a rubber grommet or something. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you do, as long as they're tidy and out of the way. So the next thing I'm going to be doing is uh, installing a control panel, thinking of putting it somewhere around here. That will house all of the switches for all of the uh, points in the yard. It will also house any additional switches for lighting, things like building lighting and yard lamps. And uh, when I eventually get some signalling in here, um, it will also house any switches or electrical stuff that I need to do um, for the uh, signalling. I'm going to make it out of scrap materials. I've got uh, a couple of bits of uh, scrap MDF battens and uh, this is a sheet of 5mm uh, plywood that uh, is now too small to be useful for anything so I will be cutting it somewhere around there and we'll have a nice area to place all of the switches um, for the points and any additional accessories. That's roughly what it'll look like from underneath and then the bits that stick out there they will screw to the underside of the baseboard I'm not going for anything particularly fancy here, it's not going to have to support any weight, it's purely just somewhere to house the switch gear for the uh, points. That's all it needs to be. So I'll cut the uh, plywood to length, screw this together, and then uh, put it underneath the uh, layout board. <laughs> So there it is. I'll be putting a top on it, uh, maybe paper or plastic card or card or something, uh, with a map of the, uh, the layout on there. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to get it secured. It's going to go in something like that. I want it recessed down slightly so it's not level with the scenery on the top, so that when you're uh, watching the trains or doing movements, it's sort of out of the way slightly. So uh, I shall screw it in, and then we can. Uh, begin planning where I'm going to put the switches. 
Okay, I've screwed it to the bottom of the baseboard. I've run a bead of glue along the join there just to uh, secure it a little better and uh, I've also uh, just brushed some PVA into the top surface of the wood um, just to smooth it out so that uh, it will take um, any um, templates or maps or paint or whatever I decide to do on the top um, for the track plan. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, start running the uh, wiring underneath for the switches that's just dangling at the moment. I'm going to run that to the control panel. Uh, there's plenty of point motors already wired in. Um, all the point motors from this point onwards are all wired up. There's about 12 point motors in all. I've got three points that need doing here, and uh, then obviously the one that joins onto the branch line, and then these two new points here need doing as well. So uh, there's going to be another six um, that need wiring up. So uh, it'll be quite busy on that little control panel. Okay, I've uh, planned out where everything needs to go. Uh, it takes a little while, I've made a couple of um, alterations uh, trying to get it all to fit on there. Um, fits on there reasonably well now, so I'm going to drill the holes, put the switches in and see how I get on with the layout and how things work. Um, once I'm happy, I'll then come back to this area and I'll put a nice top piece on with a nice proper map of the layout um, and perhaps uh, some writing or something on it as well. Um, but for now, I'm just going to put the switches in the plywood and just see how things work when actually trying to run the trains. So you can see on the switches there is a threaded section. So I'll drill a hole in the plywood that's that size and then uh, put these up uh, through the bottom, poke them up through the top and then they have uh, some nuts and washers that you can use to uh, secure them. Okay, I've connected up all the switches for all the point motors I've installed so far and uh, I've set them up so that they throw in the uh, same orientation as the, uh, the point so to uh, move the blades towards that side of the table I push the switch up and then to move the point blades back to this side of the table I move the uh, switch back towards me seem to be working. Uh, there's a couple that need slight adjustment as is always the case with these seeps. Uh, that one over there a little bit sticky, that one there a little bit sticky and the second on that freeway point is sort of every tenth throw gets a little bit stuck. Uh, so they just need a little bit of adjustment um, in terms of the orientation with the point. I imagine some they're ever so slightly like that, so I just tweak them back straight and they should uh, work a little better. So the next thing to do is to get uh, the remaining six point motors installed. That's three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So six in all um, that need to be wired up, so that's another job. And then they'll occupy that area of the control panel. Once I'm happy that everything's working, I'll put a nice top surface on the control panel and make it look a bit nicer. 
um, but for now, just for testing, I'm just going to leave it like that, keep it simple while I'm doing all the electrics. I've also started tidying some of the wiring. Uh, this sort of stuff still needs uh, tidying up, just use uh, tie wraps, things like that. Um, but what I have been tidying is the uh, the biggest issue that you always get, and it's uh, the red wires which come from the switches. They have to go from the control panel to each point motor, so you do get a hell of a lot of these wires. So uh, I've been bundling them up, as you can see, and then routing them along the baseboard like that. And then I'll try and do similar things, you know, things like this wire here will just be neatly bunched up just to try and tidy things up a little bit, but uh, it doesn't have to be ridiculously tidy, you know, you're not wiring a, a car or anything like that, it's just a, it's just a model railway table, so uh, I'll just do a little bit of tidying, but at the same time keep it all accessible should I need to come back in, add accessories, change things, or troubleshoot any problems. OK, I'm going to take a, a small break from the electrical side of things. Uh, plenty has been accomplished, but there is still plenty to do. So uh, I'm going to take a break and uh, look at the uncoupling system I'm going to be using. This is what I'm going to be using. I'm going to be using some neodymium magnets. I bought these from eBay and uh, I've got a variety here. Um, the ones on the right hand side are 3mm um, in thickness and the ones on the left are about 1mm. Um, the ones on the left have to be stacked in pairs, they're not quite powerful enough, um, and the ones on the right are perfect. Uh, so uh, I'll be using these uh, to uncouple the rakes of coaches from the uh, shunters. I'll be using magnets because I use KD couplers on the locos on the layout. With all of the gradients and the helixes and everything I've got going on, I find the KD system to be infinitely more reliable than the traditional tension locks that most stock in this country is fitted with. I imagine most of you will still use tension locks, um, so to achieve uncoupling you would simply use an uncoupling ramp and you would just put them at strategic points um, around the uh, layouts where you want to uncouple your stock. Uh, however, I'm going to be doing it slightly differently because I have the KDs, so I'll be using a magnetic system. They'll be placed mainly in two key areas. Um, there will be some at the leading ends of all of the sidings to allow an engine that has pushed a rake into the sidings uh, to uncouple. And then there'll also be some right up the other end before these points to allow a locomotive to detach from a rake that is brought in then move, up, move ahead and shunt back around. Before I start putting them in, I'm just going to quickly get rid of any of the uh, exposed point rods that are left over from the motors I've installed up at this end. I just use a, a disc cutter um, to get them off and I tend to try and leave a little bit uh, proud of the point tie bar, maybe about a millimetre or so, um, just to uh, allow um, for any bending of the rod or anything so that it doesn't uh, doesn't pop out of the, uh, the hole that it's in. Okay, uh, to install these, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, cut out a small area of the cork underneath the track and which will allow them to slide underneath the sleepers and remain relatively hidden. Um, and I also need to uh, decide obviously exactly where I want my stock to uncouple. So uh, I will put a uh, section in here, or put some magnets in over here and give you a demonstration of uh, the train bringing in some coaches and uh, you can see it uncouple. OK, so I've positioned the 33 as if it is uh, changing tracks uh, so I will know how much overhang that it has. Um, it shouldn't be too much overhang at all because the points are very relaxed. Um, but putting that there will allow me to bring in a coach and see how far I can get it down before it's going to hit the locomotive and then subsequently decide where I'm going to have the uncoupling area. Okay, so uh, I have 
two of the uh, neodymium disc magnets um, underneath the track. Um, they're positioned roughly underneath each rail. I'll show you what happens when you introduce a piece of stock with a KD coupler on it. You see the bottom of it is attracted over to the side that the uh, KD is sitting on. So when a train slows to a stop here, it's going to open that up and it's going to uncouple. But when you pass over it a little bit faster, there'll be some tension between the two and it won't do that thing where it swings to the right. So let's test it with a, a locomotive. Okay, they work uh, reasonably well. It takes a little bit of practice to get used to uh, uncoupling consistently. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is, uh, when I bought the magnets, I noticed that you could also get some rectangular ones. And uh, I think a rectangular magnet, something about that sort of size, would give a little bit more margin for error in terms of the uncoupling. You have to get the uh, the bottoms of the KDs in just the right spot so that they're at uh, their maximum swing and then they'll uncouple quite nicely. So I think if we have a longer magnet in here, that window of opportunity is going to be greater and that means that you should be able to uncouple a little bit more reliably. Okay, so that's uh, the end of uh, part five. Got the uh, control panel installed, started to tidy up some of the wiring and most of the motors are now in. So I'm going to go away and I'm going to get some uh, different magnets ordered. Um, they're very, very cheap, so uh, it doesn't really cost anything to uh, test some different magnets out and see how I get on with those, see if they're any more effective than the disc ones I'm using at the moment. Um, I also need to adjust some of the point motors just to make them a little bit more reliable. And I also need to install an additional load of point motors down that end. So uh, I will go away and do that. And uh, when we come back, uh, hopefully it should just be a few loose ends with the electric side of things to tidy up. And uh, then can actually um, start thinking about the scenery side of things and start to build up a model on the table. <laughs>